It's, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I want to thank Dominic Gorlitz and Wolfgang Schmidt. Is he here for inviting me and making this all possible? So I really am pleased to be here. Thank you. So I will try to talk about some of the secrets of the Sphinx. The Sphinx is something I have been working on now for over a quarter century. I am a PhD from Yale. I'm a geologist, geophysicist, PhD from Yale. I now teach at Boston University. I started at Boston University in 1984. I started working on the Sphinx in 1990. And the person that introduced me to the Sphinx was this man, John Anthony West. Do people? And he and I, this is younger me, began in about 1990 working on the Sphinx. At that time, the paradigm was that we were hunter-gatherers, very primitive, then people became barbarians, and ultimately civilization arose about 3500 BC. And that was the standard paradigm, the standard worldview at the time for these things, and that the Sphinx was built about 2500 BC. And one of the characteristics of civilization as it was defined was monumental stone structures. I found very quickly, 25 years ago, that geology shows there is a problem with this dating. That the Sphinx, and I will talk about this in a second, sits on the edge of the Sahara Desert. It's been hyper-arid desert for the last 5,000 years, back to 3000 BC, essentially all of alleged history of civilization. I think you know where the Sphinx is, but it sits on the edge of the Sahara Desert. It's carved from the bedrock limestone, and it sits below ground level. This is me at the pause of the Sphinx. And it's located east of the Khafra or Shefran Pyramid, and it faces due east to the rising sun. Here you can see the Sphinx circled. This is the Great Pyramid, Second Pyramid, Third Pyramid. And when they carved the Sphinx, they carved the Sphinx from the bedrock. They remo removed huge blocks and built what is known as the Sphinx Temple. So when you go there now, you still see the Pyramid of Khafra, Shephron, Sphinx, and this is the Sphinx Temple. This is known as the Valley Temple. Both of these temples were built from blocks that came out of the Sphinx enclosure. Here's the uh, Sphinx Temple. And there's a person for scale. You can see how huge these blocks are, limestone blocks. Now, I'm a geologist, and what I studied these are people for scale. You can see how the Sphinx was carved out of the bedrock. And I studied initially the weathering, the erosion on the Sphinx and on the walls of the Sphinx enclosure. And what I found very early on is that you look at this weathering and erosion, this was caused by rain, by water coming down, not what you expect in a desert condition. So this said to me right away as a geologist that there was something wrong here with the dating. That the dating had to go back to a period when it was pre-Sahara. Here you can see diagrammatically what you get with the rain erosion versus the wind erosion. There are layers of rock and in both cases it takes out the softer layers but with a very different style, a very different weathering pattern. Here we can see real photographs. This is the Sphinx enclosure. This is the wall of the Sphinx enclosure. This is wind erosion on the Giza Plateau of Old Kingdom structures that according to Egyptologists are approximately within a century or two the same age as this, but this doesn't make sense geologically. This has to be older to earlier climatic period. Here we see the same thing here. 
This is the wind features. Notice how it's very angular, looks very different than the rolling, undulating features that are caused by water, caused by precipitation. And this is myself just this past about a year ago, a little over a year ago. Here we see exactly the same thing, just to give you a sense of what is caused by rain. And what I concluded very early on is that this Great Sphinx dates back to an earlier climatic period, not 2500 BC, but my initial estimate was at least 5000 to 7000 or earlier. Had to go back to this earlier period where it was much more rainy, much more moist, much more temperate before the onset of the desert period. And it had to go back enough in time to cause this massive erosion, to cause this massive weathering. Now since then, the Sphinx has been buried in sand, literally for thousands of years. We have records of the ancient dynastic Egyptians digging it out of the sand, and that sand, from a geological point of view, protected the weathering, protected the earlier weathering. That's a 19th century photograph. This is uh, early 17th century. Notice the Sphinx. You don't see the body. It was buried up to its neck in sand. Other evidence, there's lots of evidence. I'll summarize some of it. For instance, in Saqqara, not far from Giza, you have mud brick mastabas. These are dried mud brick mastabas. These are first, second, early dynastic period, first, second dynasty, these particular ones. They are beautifully preserved, shows that Sahara arid conditions had existed even prior to when the Egyptologists say the Sphinx was carved. These would be destroyed completely if there had been the rains necessary in their time to, to weather the Sphinx. The Sphinx has to be older. Here's another piece of evidence. This is the back of the Sphinx, the rump of the Sphinx. This is a goalie formed by lots of water that was running down. It was formed by water running down. It's an erosional gully. The thing is, it should not be there. Great Pyramid, Second Pyramid, Third Pyramid. Can you see the Sphinx? Originally, water, when it rained on the Giza Plateau, water would run like this. It ran off the back into this area. So the water would flow because there's a flow from the northwest to the southeast. The water would flow down this way, run off the back. That's why that gully formed. The thing is, Great Pyramid, Second Pyramid, this is a map. This is the Sphinx. When they built the Great Pyramid, at least part of it, and I would say the old, uh, younger part of it, but the upper portions, they quarried here. They quarried in this area, worked by Khufu. They quarried in this area. When they quarried, that stopped the flow of water. This indicates, as many geologists have said to me when I've presented this at geological means, this indicates the Sphinx has to be older than the Great Pyramid. There's no question about it geolo geologically. It's a matter of how much older, not is it older, it has to be older. Egyptologists tell us that this was carved after the Great Pyramid. It's impossible. When I say Egyptologists, the standard conventional uh, majority. So this quarry would stop the flow of water indicates that this had to form, the Sphinx enclosure had to have been carved out much earlier. And if you look here, here's the Sphinx. You can see how it sits in the enclosure. These are the quarries up here. It would have stopped the flow of water. Something else that's been suggested. 
one geologist, and I don't want to name his name, he uh, works for archaeologists, certain archaeologists. He looked at my work. He said, I was right that, yes, the Sphinx is eroded in very, very ancient times, thousands of years before the Old Kingdom. But his explanation was that it was natural erosion on a yard dang, on a natural hill. So it was a natural hill that was eroded by the wind, by the rain, by the elements. It started to look like a sphinx. So it was going from one, two, three. See how it starts to look like a sphinx? And the Egyptians said it looks like a sphinx. So they came and they carved it into a sphinx. And what you have, he said, is natural erosion that's very ancient, but that had nothing to do with when it was carved into a sphinx. So that was his explanation. The problem is he forgot that when they carved the body of the Sphinx, these erosional features here are below the original ground level. They carved it. They had to remove all this material. And what he's effectively saying is that natural wind and rain removed all this material, but we know that this material, when it was removed, it was cut out as huge blocks to form the temple. And geologically, wind and rain naturally does not cut blocks and build temples. So that falsifies this hypothesis. Another thing is we have ancient repairs on the Sphinx. Sometimes people go and they see the Sphinx for the first time and they think that the Sphinx is built out of lots of little blocks as well as the bedrock. Here I'm looking, this is my hand. These are very ancient. These are more recent. These in fact are from the 1990s because I watched them put them there at the time. Zahi Hawass, among others, has told me numerous times that some of these repairs go back to Old Kingdom. If those are Old Kingdom repairs, this implies geologically that the structure itself must be much older. And when you look at it and you try to reconstruct how much has eroded away, we're talking at least a meter or so, in English about three plus feet, but at least a meter deep of erosion. So incredible erosion. And you don't get that much erosion, even in a thousand years, but much less just a couple of hundred years to have to repair it in Old Kingdom times. In fact, you don't get that much erosion even to have to repair it in New Kingdom times, geologically, given the climate that we had in New Kingdom and subsequent times. So the problem, it's a real problem as to the traditional dating to have that much erosion, that much necessary repair. And this actually ties in with something else very recently. There are some pictures of them repairing. Recently, there have been surface luminescence dates found or um, calculated by sampling from it the Sphinx Temple and the Valley Temple. They came up with dates ranging from about 3100 BC plus or minus 500 years or so, to 10,500 BC, plus or minus five years. Superficially, some people said, well, this shows that the Sphinx does date to dynastic period. I don't believe it's the case. I've looked at their work very carefully. What they are measuring, I am of the opinion that in my assessment, what they are measuring is not the original construction, but repairs to these structures. It was being repaired, it was being reworked in dynastic times, including Old Kingdom, early and Old Kingdom dynastic times, right up until New Kingdom and Middle, middle New Kingdom and even a bit later. These are structures that were taken over, used and reused over and over. 
And we can see that, and I have pointed this out for over 20 years now. For instance, the Sphinx Temple. Here we have the Sphinx Temple. This is John Anthony West. Uh, we have the Sphinx Temple, and what you have is a limestone core and a granite facing on it. And when you look at this closely, you go into the Sphinx Temple. Here you see the um, granite facing. But what you find, this is the granite. This is the granite. But it is being used to repair and restore a much more ancient structure. What they were testing is the restoration, not the original structure. And in fact, I am convinced, and I've looked at this numerous times now, that in some cases, they actually cut the granite blocks to fit the very ancient weathered structure. They were trying to keep as much as possible of the original structure. And you can see it very faintly here. There are hieroglyphic inscriptions on the granite from Old Kingdom times, which means this granite has to be at least Old Kingdom times. It could be older, and then it was re-inscribed during Old Kingdom times. But either way, my interest is these much earlier structures, which are contemporaneous with the original Sphinx, because they were built from blocks carved out when the Sphinx was originally carved. And this gets to another factor. The head of the Sphinx is much too small for the body. Many people know that. Many archaeologists, Egyptologists, initially said that I was absolutely crazy for many reasons, they thought. One was that they said, look at the head of the Sphinx. It is a dynastic head. And I said, no, it doesn't matter. Yes, it's a dynastic head, but it's too small for the body. Why? Because it's not the original head. Real Sphinxes, in proportion, they have much larger heads relative to the body. The Great Sphinx does not have its original head. Maybe it was a Sphinx originally. Maybe it was something else. Maybe it was a lion originally. Whatever it was, my assessment, my opinion, is that the original head eroded down. It was damaged. So was the body. For the body, what they did is they worked on repairing it. So they repaired it with blocks. That would be incredibly difficult for the head. They had this eroded head, and they carved it smaller to restore it. So you ended up with something where the head was too small for the body. Something else that we did, and a lot of people don't pay enough attention to it, in my assessment. In fact, I've had many of my critics critics ignore this line of research, but it's incredibly important, is we did seismic testing around the Sphinx. So what we did is we used a sledgehammer. A sledgehammer, we hit a steel plate, and basically sound or energy penetrates into the rock, it goes down, you can pick up different layers, different densities of rock, and we got incredibly interesting results when we did this. And this is younger me. What we found is that the erosion, the subsurface erosion and weathering, really I should say weathering technically, the subsurface weathering is uneven around the Sphinx. It is much deeper, much deeper on the sides and in the front. It's very shallow in the back. And here we can see it diagrammatically. It is twice or more as deep on three sides as it, is, as it is in the back. What this indicates is that originally the back portion was connected to the bedrock. And also, this back portion, when we calibrate, that is compatible, that makes sense for Old Kingdom times. But these, this much 
deeper weathering on the other three sides, again, indicates that the original structure goes back thousands of years earlier. So what I believe was the case is that originally, in the back, it was only carved down to this level. And then this portion right in here was freed up, was carved down to at about 2500 BC, about 2500 BC, when the Sphinx was being refurbished, repaired. That may be when the head was recarved, or somewhere along the lines, but that would be dynastic times. But the original Sphinx goes back much earlier. So this was very strong confirmation of my initial estimate that the Sphinx must go back to earlier climatic period. And when I did my initial estimate, I was thinking in terms of seven to 5,000 BC. Honestly, as the data has developed uh, and uh, more information has come in, this data is compatible with back to 10,000 BC. I'm very um, uh, open to that. In fact, I think that's probably more likely, given everything that we're putting together, has to do with things like the calibration of the seismic data, other data that we've been able to develop since then, and new lines of evidence. So what I believe is the case is that originally, the rump of the Sphinx was connected to the bedrock here. Only the top portion of that back was carved out. The rest was carved um, along the sides and in the front. And the Sphinx essentially emerged from the bedrock, which interestingly, when the Sphinx looks out to itself in the sky, Leo, everyone knows the constellation Leo? That's essentially what it looks like. In Old Kingdom times, this portion was carved out during the restoration, during the repairs. When would it have looked out at Leo? One possibility, and I think you'll hear more about this, is 12,000 years ago, about 10,000 BC on the vernal equinox, which would be the what? Do people know this? Age of Leo, the processional age of Leo. And in fact, I suspect that the original Sphinx, a lion, may have been a marker or somehow tied in with that early period. Was it a male Sphinx? Or, I'm sorry, a male lion? Maybe it was a male, um, maybe it was a female lion. That's another possibility. We just don't know because we don't have the original head. Something else we found with the seismic work is, I don't want to go into all of this, but notice this right here. It's called A, Anomaly A. Do you see the outline of the Sphinx? You're looking down on the Sphinx. So here's the paws of the Sphinx, the head, the rump. We found different anomalies. There may be a tunnel type feature along here, but this is the one to focus on. This is a hard layer, that's not, um, a cavity or tunnel. This is a cavity. We found a cavity under the left paw. It is there. I have no doubt about it. Artificial cavity. Have people heard of Edgar Casey? Some people say that Edgar Casey predicted that there would be something around this area. I don't know, but about that, but I do know there's a cavity there, some kind of chamber, and it looks artificial. It has yet to be explored. One more thing to do. Uh, one of the secrets that remains for the Sphinx. So my initial work on the Sphinx pushed it back to the five to 7,000 year period. This is my version of a timeline. You've seen something like this already. Where we have today, we're going back, beginning of civilization, according to the traditional archaeologists and historians, about three to 4,000 BC. I was pushing the Sphinx back to thousands of years earlier. And to give you a geological time reference, this is the end of the last ice age. So I did this. I thought it was great, but 
many Egyptologists and archaeologists and historians thought was horrible, and <laughs> it made headlines about rewriting history and clashing on the age of the Egyptian Sphinx, R debate rages over the Sphinx's age. Uh, NBC actually ran, made and ran a documentary called The Mystery of the Sphinx, hosted by Charlton Heston. Do people know Charlton Heston? Yeah, he, he was picked because he was uh, played Moses in a very famous movie. And this was made into a DVD. You can still get the DVD, but I want to warn you, if you get the DVD, DVD version, it's been sold and re-edited and supplemented. It's got all kinds of stuff in it that I don't like, but that's what they tend to do commercially. What happened, though, from our point of view, is in 1992, so this was very early in my work on it, the Egyptologists were so upset that they had a special debate at the American Association for the End American Association um, for the Advancement of Science annual meeting in Chicago where they wanted to debate the age of the Sphinx. I thought they wanted to debate the age of the Sphinx. They told me that. So I came. This is actually me. And they said we were going to debate the age of the Sphinx. I said this was great because I could show all my evidence and data. They did not want to see evidence and data. They just wanted to say I was wrong. And their classic comment was, this is from archae um, Egyptologist Mark Lehner, who is sitting there nice and smug. Uh, he said, and this was to put me down and so I would never talk about it again, he said definitively, because he knew everything about the Sphinx. If the Sphinx was built by an earlier culture, where is the evidence of that civilization? Where are the pottery shards? People during that age were hunters and gatherers. They didn't build cities. Because he, everyone assumed thousands of years before the rise of civilization as they knew it, 3500 BC, everyone was primitive, they couldn't build sphinxes, they couldn't travel across oceans, they didn't have high technology, they, you know, people were just primitive hunters and gatherers. I, this is me at the time, <laughs> um, I was pretty disgusted by <laughs> the comments. Because um, I knew that the geology was very good. I had presented this to my geological colleagues. Many geological colleagues said, yes, you're absolutely right. In fact, it's very simple. They didn't understand why Egyptologists didn't understand it. Uh, but I didn't have, at the time, this is 1992, I didn't have another site showing advanced civilization. So this now brings us to the next point. This is Dr. Herr Professor Dr. Klaus Schmidt, who unfortunately is now deceased. Uh, he and I are talking on site at Gebekli Tepe. Gebekli Tepe. So remember, 1992 was the debate. Since about 1995, so several years later, he first really found or rediscovered Gebekli Tepe, began excavating Gebekli Tepe at, um, it's a site near Urfa, which interestingly ties in with biblical themes because that's the traditional home of the biblical Abraham in southeast Turkey. It's very near the Syrian border. But what was important, and I had to explore for myself, is he had what he called at the time major building phases from 10,000 BC to 8,000 BC, what I had referred to informally as Sphinx Age. Here's where Gebekli Tepe is located. It's in Mesopotamia, between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers in northern Mesopotamia. What some people say is the biblical um, Eden, the area of Eden. And Gebekli Tepe, was even older than my original estimate for the Great Sphinx at the time. So he was also pushing things back. 
It's a credible site. Here's an overview of it. It has stone circles. Only four have been substantially excavated as of this, as of this year because it's a very big site. There are 20 or more megalithic stone circles. Most of them are still under the ground. They have to be excavated, but they've been found by geophysical methods. Uh, things like ground penetrating radar. Uh, did I skip one? By me? Uh, ground penetrating radar, different things like that. Uh, she's right here. This is my wife, Katie who took many of these photographs. She comes with me on all the trips and uh, is an integral part of the research. Here's a photograph she took of me there. You see the stone circle? And when you look at this, it is very, very sophisticated. See how beautifully carved these are. This is about 10,000 BC, 9 to 10,000 BC. If you just looked at this, I've asked several archaeologists informally if they found something like this in isolation. They didn't have any dating for it. They just had to estimate how old it would be. They've told me, several have told me about 1,000, maybe 2,000 BC, maybe 600 BC not 9,000 to 10,000 BC. Incredibly sophisticated. This is one of most people's favorites. Look at this animal carved. And this is not stuck to the post. They plan to have it there. So they carved it. This is all um, one piece of rock, one piece of uh, stone. There's another that's a little happy fox. And can you see there's a little animal there, a little pig there? So there are different things. This is carved in relief. This is incised on. It was being used and it was being reused for thousands of years. Here shows some of the pillars. And there's some more pillars. They are anthropomorphic. They are human-like. Do you see the arms and hands? So this is, has its arms and hands like that, you see? And there's a fox here. And this would be its what? Head. But they were showing it representationally like that. It's like sort of almost beautiful artwork, semi-abstract. And I think that was very, very intentional. Here's another one of the pillar. They're very tall, very um, uh, narrow, very beautifully done, and set very loosely, not loosely, very shallow in the bedrock. They may have actually vibrated intentionally. What I was particularly interested in is how this was dated. So I discussed this at length with Dr. Schmidt and just a few summary points. They're ornately carved in relief. Here you can see the arms, the fox. Do you see the hands? And this is a belt. You see the belt? And a loincloth. This is about four meters tall or so. And they weigh up to 10, 15 tons. They're anthropomorphic. And they were set, set very shallowly in the bedrock with a kind of concrete. 12,000 years ago, should not exist, but it does. And they were intentionally buried by 8,000 BC. We know this because once they were buried, we can see that it was intentionally buried. You can tell that geologically uh, by the way the rock covered them over. So they were not just left to be covered by the wind and the sand and the rain. It wasn't abandoned. It was intentionally buried first. And once it was buried, mineralogical changes occurred. New minerals formed like in a cave. Stalactites and stalagmites formed on a micro scale. Those can be radiocarbon dated. And it all indicates it was entirely covered 10,000 years ago. So it's a very old site, very complex site. Notice how 
You've got the hands and arms. There's some close-ups of in the navel region. They're holding a loincloth. And just a quick picture. Some people say this is a designer belt, 10,000 BC. Beautifully done. You see the buckle? And you see how it has, it looks like inscription. Could they have had some kind of writing? I mean, if you saw just a designer logo today, what would you make of it? And very important to our story is that it was, had catastrophe. You have breakage here, and then it was intentionally buried. This is the way it was really found. This is not archaeological reconstruction. Look at this pillar. Do you see how that pillar fell over? Then it was put back up in ancient times, 10,000 years ago. These crude rock walls were put up against them to hold them back into place. And then the whole thing was covered over. So there's evidence of major catastrophe and then re-erection crudely, hastily, then the whole thing is buried over. Here we see how they did this crude wall up against the pillar to maybe prop it up to protect it temporarily before it was covered over. Here we have one very dramatically. Do you see this pillar there? We'll look at a quick close-up. This pillar got knocked over there was some kind of catastrophic event here. They propped it up very quickly with the remains of part of that pillar and some other blocks. Does everyone see that? And then they built these walls. Then they covered the whole thing over with dirt and debris and sediment, which is what the archaeologists excavated out to get to this point to see what was going on. So why did they do this? Why were they intentionally burying everything by 8,000 BC? Uh, Klaus Schmidt said that they spent as much time burying it, covering it over, as they did to build it. As much energy, I should say. So why? This takes us back to the next part of the story, which is the end of the last ice age. What is going on at the end of the last ice age? Because that's when Gebekli Tepe comes from. Gebekli Tepe spans the end of the last ice age. And at the end of the last ice age, we have something known as the Younger Dryas. The Younger Dryas is interesting because the ice age was starting to end. It was starting to warm up. Then it got colder. That's known as the Younger Dryas. Then it got dramatically warmer. So the Younger Dry starts about 10,900 BC, and then you have a dramatic warming at 9,700 BC, which is exactly Gebekli Tepe time. A little geology and climatology. This is from a book I'm a co-author on, and it's a quasi-log scale. So here it's very cold in the Ice Age. It starts to get warmer. Everyone see that? Then it gets cold. This is the Younger Dryas. Then it suddenly gets really warm and stays warm, you know, with little ups and downs, but stays warm right up to the present. When I was a graduate student, we used to think that when it had a sudden warming, that might be 100 years or 500 years. In the last decade, we found that from ice core data, this is ice core data, this sudden warming, initially it was thought it might be two or three years, which is very sudden geologically. But now things have even changed in the last year. We now have from ice core data, this is years. This is older to younger. This is one year, another year, another year. This is the last year based on isotopes of the ice age. This is the first year of post-Ice Age. The Ice Age ends not even within a year, within weeks, probably days. Just a couple of days. So what could indicate, what could cause us to literally snap out of an Ice Age within just days? That's what the evidence indicates now, incredibly quickly. 
Um, something else that's happening at the end of the last ice age, it's dated by ice cores. And this is very accurate now because we have like tree rings, the ice core rings, the ice core levels. It's almost exactly 9700 BC. And this is the time when all the big ice age animals go extinct. They actually go extinct. This is cal uncalibrated. They go extinct right at this level, which correlates with what in calendar years is 9700 BC. So something is going on there, something very, very dramatic. So end of the last ice age, you start to have cold periods, 10,900 BC, and then you have this warming spell, 9700 BC. Just as a comment, 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 I want to say comment, as a thought, some people think it's a comet that caused all this, or an asteroid, uh, and I know a lot of people think that's a nice, it's, it's almost too good to be true. It turns out that um, the evidence is now very much against it in the last couple of years. It has not held up to uh, scrutiny, and we have to accept that. But what does seem to be the case is that the sun, the sun is not stable. It is going through periods of fluctuation. It's actually doing it now, and it was doing it at the end of the last ice age. The sun, all the evidence in my assessment points to the sun, that the sun, the sun is sometimes quiet and stable, sometimes it's not. And the sun is not as stable as most people believe. The sun sometimes undergoes major outbursts. It ejects what are known as plasma discharges, so basically electrically charged particles, um, and they can hurtle toward Earth if Earth is in the wrong place at the wrong time. And this would cause massive destruction. It could dramatically warm the climate, which is exactly what we see. It could do it in just a matter of days, even hours initially. And it would have the potential to end an ice age. The Greenland ice core data, there's sediment core data, there's lunar data from the moon that all indicates that something is happening instantaneously in 9700 BC. To tie in with this, everyone knows what the northern lights are? That's from very small plasma discharges, solar, wind, they call it, very small. But what you get is you get things in the sky. Now, when this is very mild with classic northern lights, you only see it at high latitudes. You have to be close to the North Pole or the South Pole. Everyone follow? If it gets stronger, you start to see it in more parts of the world. If it's strong enough, you see it all around the world. And that's what happened in ancient times. There was a man, well, man, he was an astrophysicist. He's now deceased, Thomas Gold at Cornell University. He started talking about these types of phenomena in 1960s, in the 1960s. And he suggested that when there's a big solar outburst, so this is a quote from him, the Earth's magnetic field, the R magnetic field helps protect us, but if it's too strong, it doesn't protect us. That when there's a really big one, the Earth's magnetic field can't up, hold up. It can't hold up to the incoming gas, the charged particles. And what you would get is at the atmospheric level, you would get essentially what he called a series of sparks. It would look like huge lightning strikes and would create things that you see in the sky um, for periods of time. It would carry hundreds of millions of amperes, and it would cause destruction on the ground physically. Sometimes in some places, like a tornado hitting, it would cause atmospheric changes. It would cause climate changes. It would cause radiation levels to rise on the surface, and you would get all kinds of effects. One thing he suggested you need to look for to prove this is what's known as vitrification, where rock is hit by this discharge. It gets very hot, very quickly melts, and then refreezes. Vitrification refers to glass, so natural glass. Everyone follow? 
and he saw this. What do we have orbiting around us? The moon. If the earth was hit, the moon would be hit also, he suggested. And he actually, the same Thomas Gold, studied the lunar surface from the Apollo missions and samples that were brought back. He found evidence of this on the moon. I have been studying this. This is the mode of Mark in Scotland. This goes back to about 10,000 BC, end of the last ice age. Here, I'm holding in my hand, you see that? That is vitrification. That is from the same type of phenomena, very high, very intense um, heat just on the surface. In Egypt, we have something that no is known as a Dakle glass, which classically, because people didn't know how to explain it, uh, this is covered over, this is over an uh, area of about 400 square kilometers. People said, well, it must be a comet. It doesn't fit comet characteristics. What it does fit is solar outburst characteristics. Um, and this again shows you what vitrification looks like. So there's a lot of evidence that something is happening at the end of the last ice age, that there were major solar outbursts. Uh, we have isotope data, which records solar activity. I'll come back to that in a few minutes. We have uh, data from sediments, from lunar data of ancient vitrification. There's other evidence, too, and I want to point that out, and that is from petroglyphs. And I want to introduce another colleague here for a few minutes. This is Anthony Perrot, Dr. Anthony Perrot who works for Los Alamos National Laboratories. He is a specialist on high energy plasma physics from stars, from the sun, between different bodies in the solar system. If you don't know what plasma is technically, it's this. This is a picture of it. Most of the universe is actually plasma bulk-wise. There's solids, there's liquids, there's gases. Everyone knows those three, the states of matter. The fourth is plasma. It's electrically charged particles, which are neither solid, liquid, nor gas, technically. And that's what he studies. And what he found was that when you have plasma discharges from stars, and the sun is a star, if it hits a planet's atmosphere, like the Earth, it will react with the atmosphere. It makes shapes in the sky. So you would th see things in the sky. Everyone follow? And those take on very distinctive shapes, very distinctive configurations. So you can think of the northern and southern lights, but it becomes less diffuse. It becomes more distinctive. And it would take on distinctive shapes that he has, with computers, simulated simulations. And do you see how they sort of look like stick figure men? But not exactly like humans. So if we had a major solar outburst, plasma discharges into the atmosphere, what you would start to get, these are, um, this is northern lights, it would become even more distinctive than this, and it would start taking on different shapes. So he's modeled that would take on shapes like stick figure men's with dots on their sides, things that would look like um, stick figure men what with bird's heads, and also what we call donut type shapes. And he has looked at petroglyphs around the world. Petroglyphs are when people scratch on rock in very ancient times. And what you get are things in over 130 countries looking very similar. People don't really have extra sets of arms or little dots on their sides. But this is what you would see in the sky during a major solar outburst. And here's some more pictures of them from uh, this Saudi Arabia and United Arab Emirates. When Katie and I were speaking in Norway, we went to see some petroglyphs. We found the same types of things, again, dating back to the end of the last ice age. 
Um, another place where you get petroglyphs, very sophisticated ones, is in the South Pacific on Easter Island. Um, Anthony Perrot, Dr. Perrot, did some work there. Katie and I followed up and expanded on it. Easter Island's a fascinating place. It's where you have the big heads. Uh, but what you also get are petroglyphs. Do you see the bird man there? Does everyone see that? Yeah, so you get these petroglyphs and they have something else. It's indigenous script, it's known as the Rongo Rongo, but what does it look like? Anyone see? Katie, my wife, first pointed this out. She knows that the Rongo Rongo looks a lot like the plasma configurations and the petroglyphs and it turns out that the very strong case can be made that they were recording the same thing. So you've got the plasma configurations. Here, will you start with this one? Plasma configurations, this is what they look like. This is the Rongo Rongo, the Rongo Rongo, and various petroglyphs. They were all recording something happening in the sky thousands of years ago. Here you have bird-headed men, stick figures, the other shapes, sort of donut type shapes. In fact, notice how the Rongo Rongo fits even the better in many ways, the plasma configurations. And lots of cultures have, uh, have traditions along these lines. One in Easter Island is that they were gazing towards the sky and something happened there. They talked about how the sky fell at one point and it fell and then it went back. So, Dr. Perrot and his team, his associates, came to the conclusion that there was evidence for intense solar outburst in prehistory. They have never been able to date it. I suggest that the date, in fact, all the evidence suggests, the date is the end of the last ice age. That this is a major catastrophe at the end of the last ice age that what we have at the end of the last ice age is advanced civilization, Gobekli Tepe, Sphinx, end of the last ice age, that you had earlier cycle of civilization as people like Plato talked about. When was Atlantis? He dates it to that period, what we would say is the end of the last ice age, and that it was wiped out by these catastrophes a major solar outburst. You would have sudden melting of glaciers. What happens? You get lots of uh, atmospheric moisture that has to come back out is precipitation. So you've got torrential rains and flooding. You've got rising sea levels. You're relieving pressure from the surface of the earth when you take off kilometers of ice very, very suddenly in the high latitudes. This sets off earthquake activity and um, volcanic activity. This has been demonstrated in Iceland in recent times. You would deplete the stratospheric ozone layer. You would um, change atmospheric and oceanic circulation patterns. You would have literal incineration of parts of the earth where you had wildfires being set from plasma discharges hitting in certain areas. Wherever you saw vitrification, as I was showing you, you would set fires undoubtedly, and this would cause the rapid end of the last ice age. Remember the catastrophic, the incredible precipitation and erosion on the Sphinx? Part of it, I think, our good chunk goes back to this time. Coming back to Gebekli Tepe, why did they bury everything? Because literally, there were these catastrophic changes on Earth. So they, their civilization was being wiped out. They tried to restore things as best they could. They tried to preserve things, um, but ultimately they had to cover over. How would you escape this short term? Especially radiation levels, which have been calculated to be very high on the surface. You go where? underground and there is incredible tradition of going underground or preparing to be able to do that again because the ancestors had to do that so easter island you have these artificial houses or caves that really serve no purpose except they would be very good to protect from an event like this the easter islanders 
built these. Uh, they also have a tradition of going into the caves. We were there on one of our trips to Easter Island. A fellow who was a native and had learned the traditions from his ancestors just said to us, oh yeah, they had to live in caves for a long time because there were things happening on the surface. He knew nothing about the research we we're pursuing. He's, here's the entrance to one of the Easter Island caves inside. They're basically lava tubes that they enhanced. Uh, 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 Dr. Heinrich Kusch has done a lot of work recently on underground tunnels and caves. Very mysteriously, he thinks, there's these 12,000 years old caves associated with so many sites. That's the end of the last ice age. Very perplexing. Why did they build these? They cut them into solid rock in many cases. Well, it makes sense if you needed them to survive. As a side note, humans can do this, but how about big animals like woolly mammoths or woolly rhinoceros? They can't go into caves. They don't know to go into caves. Radiation levels and other catastrophes on the surface, that's what caused them to go extinct because there's this mass extinction geologically all at this one time frame. One last Point I want to make, Cappadocia, do people know Cappadocia? The, this is the place known for underground cities. These earliest versions, I believe, go back to this very remote period. This is Kamakali, just one of the ones that you can visit. And you go into it, it's got, they're incredible, perfect ventilation. They could house thousands of people. You go in there, they're just absolutely amazing. The standard story of archaeologists is that these were built in relatively recent times. What I mean by that is 3,000, 2,000 years ago or so, and that they were to escape their enemies. Now, that makes no sense whatsoever. What would the enemy do? They would see where the city is because all the big pile of debris would be on top because they had to carve all this out. And then you go, you just find the entrances, you close them off, you let everyone suffocate and starve. It turns out we don't find the big piles of debris. Why not? Because I believe these go back so many thousands of years that it's all eroded away. This is the way you would protect yourself from a solar outburst. If it were comets, it would just collapse them, frankly. Um, if it, it really, to my, in my assessment, it makes no sense other than in terms of what seems to have happened at the end of the last ice age, because this would protect you from radiation levels, events like that. Something else about Cappadocia is it does seem this is one of the pockets where humanity survived. Independent evidence of that is something like this. Well, here's Gebekli Tepe. I just want to point this out. Um, Cappadocia is this region, so we're talking the same basic part of the world. I think another pocket may have been down here with my sphinx, with the sphinx. But this is the Cappadocia region. Independent line of evidence, looking at the origins and expansion of the Indo-European language family. We were talking about how we need to be interdisciplinary, looking at different lines of evidence. When this is analyzed, it turns out that going back, if you calibrate this, going back in time to the end of the last ice age, linguistically, there was a pocket here that expanded from that region. At, from, that seems to have been a pocket of, I'm sorry, I got the wrong pocket. The pocket of people that expanded from this region in Cappadocia, that's this color here, um, expanded from here at the end of the last ice age and then moved out and you can then map the pattern of languages. Everyone understand? But it goes back to a pocket in this region at the end of the last ice age in the Cappadocia region. What is happening after that? So I am saying that the evidence suggests, and this is what Dominic was saying also, that the evidence suggests there was real sophistication, things going on as far back as the end of the last ice age. Sphinx, Gebekli Tepe, we heard about transoceanic travel. Um, 
the plant relationships, the more advanced sophistication, technologically, even with iron, we're not sure how far back goes back, but something wiped out this early cycle of civilization. I believe it was a solar activity, and what we have was a Siddha, Katie and I have been calling it Siddha, solar-induced dark age. This is a site also in Turkey known as Chalhuyuk. This is supposed to be, this is in fact, thousands of years younger than Gebekli Tepe, but it is much less sophisticated. And this is what we have, essentially the Dark Age. And here you have a site where you, <clears throat> you lack monumental stonework. It's all just mud brick. Do you see how primitive it is? It's civilization in decline, collapsing. So what we have, what I'm suggesting, is that we had advanced civilization here. We have a dark age. This gets wiped out at the end of the last ice age by the events. We have Siddha, our solar-induced dark age. And then we have not the beginning of civilization, but a re-emergence of civilization about five to 6,000 years ago. And People like, Land, um, people like Plato were right. There was advanced civilization, an earlier cycle of civilization very early on. Now, one last point I want to make in the last 30 seconds or so. Could a solar outburst happen again? Could our civilization go the same way? Could 12,000 years from now people say, oh, there were advanced people when we live now, but they have no evidence of it. So could this all happen again? The answer is yes, we may be overdue. Thomas Gold, remember I mentioned Thomas Gold? Very early worker. He thought it might happen um, maybe once every 10,000 years. If that's the case, we're really overdue because it's been about 12,000 years. When you look at isotope data, I said I would come back to some of the isotope data. Um, this is a uh, time frame. So this is the end of the last ice age up to 4,000 years, 4,000 BC. This is the last 6,000 years, 4,000 to BC to 2,000 AD. Notice how at the end of the last ice age, you want to see when it's above that line. Do you see how the sun was very active, but also very erratic? So very active, unactive, active. Do you see how it's swinging back and forth? Very volatile, very erratic, very unstable. Then the sun serves. So this is what wiped out those early civilizations end of the last ice age. Ice age. Then it starts to get less active. It becomes much more stable for thousands of years. In recent times, look what's happening. It's starting to get really active, really volatile again. So be warned, um, it could happen again. I am saying, and I'm not trying to predict doom and gloom, but as a geologist, something you learn very early on, if it happened in the past, will it happen again? Yes. How many times have people said, oh, that volcano hasn't exploded for 4,000 years. It must be dormant. Then it explodes. So, so bottom line is we have civilization prior to the end of last ice age, thousands of years before the traditional beginning of civilization. Um, just a few last comments. Uh, to promote this type of research, just recently, uh, I and some of my colleagues, we have a new, in America, nonprofit organization, Oracle. If you're interested in that, we can give you more information or uh, go online about it. Uh, it stands for Oracle. Is a, stands for Organization for the Research of Ancient Cultures, because I really think it's important that we have conferences like this, that we collaborate, that we really make this serious research, uh, and it's not just you know, a lot of diverse groups. So this is one thing we're trying to do. Also, uh, I got to put a little plug in here. If you want to come on, see any of these sites, uh, I do take people on different sites. You can come to my website. And I think that there may be copies of um, my, one of my books is Forgotten Civilization, and there's a, actually a German version of it, which I think we, I haven't seen them yet, but it will be here. But if you'd like to visit my website, 
and find out more information because I had to do this very quickly. That's my website. And if you'd like, to, I have a mailing list. If you'd like to be on the mailing list, email Katie, my wife, at that address. So thank you very much.